Bank's existence. I think it's wonderful that the United States is uh, serving as a host. I want to recognize my friend Elliot Pedrosa, who's the uh, executive director for the United States. Thanks, Elliot, for being here. Um, I'm really pleased that our, the U.S. government has been um, has has chosen to host this event. It's very appropriate that it's here in the United States. Um, the Inter-American Development Bank has been a great partner uh, to the region, but it's also been a particularly important and critical partner to what are called small states, countries of a certain economic size and a certain population. And there's more than 20 of them in the Western Hemisphere, and uh, I think. The fact that the IDB takes a long view and takes a partnership approach has been critical on, on an, a whole series of different issues. Um, I think the world is changing at the same time, and so the kind of partnership that the Inter-American Development Bank is going to have with small states is going to change as these countries change. Um, I was really, we've done a we're doing a series of papers about the future of each of the regional development banks. and. My friend, Dr. Juan Jose Dabub and I uh, wrote a paper on opportunities for future IDV development in Latin America and the Caribbean, and so it's in the back if you'd like a copy. But I think it's, it's very appropriate um, that, we're, that we're here today to talk about this in the context of the fact that we've been working on each of the, looking at the future of each of the regional development banks, and in particular, I think this conversation about small states. So I'm really grateful. Uh, I think we've got a diverse set of speakers uh, from across the region. We worked really hard with the staff of the Inter-American Development Bank to make sure that this event was additive to what the program of seminars is going to be on Friday. I know our, our friends, our friends, the staff and the board of the Inter-American Development Bank have worked very hard to have a very successful uh, program of seminars on Friday. And so we wanted to do something that was additive and supplemental to that. And we think, we think, we think we've succeeded. We also worked really hard to make sure that we had a diverse set of views from small states in the region, and, and we, I think we've also done that as well. So I'm very grateful my colleague, Romina Bendor, who's a senior fellow here at CSIS, is going to moderate this. So I'm going to ask uh, my friends and colleagues to come up, and let's get the panel started, please. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to CSIS. My name is Romina Bandura. I'm a senior fellow here, and I'm very honored to be moderating this panel today. Um, let me briefly introduce you our distinguished panelists. To my left is Juan Jose, Dr. Juan, Juan Jose Dabu. He is former managing director of the World Bank and former finan finance minister of El Salvador. Um, next to Dr. Daboob is J uh, Jade Tijon. She's representative uh, for Suriname, Suriname from the board of, of the Inter-American Development Bank. Um, and then we have uh, Mario Marroquin Rivera. He is a representative for Guatemala in the Central American Chair of the Board for the Inter-American Development Bank. And last but not least, um, Ambassador Noel Lynch, um, he's ambassador of Barbados to the United States, and he's re permanent representative uh, for the OAS, and he was former fi um, minister of tourism of Barbados. So let me kick off um, the discussion with um, how does the IDB uh, fit into your prior life or into your current life? What are you uh, working on with the IDB and, you know, just give us some uh, brief remarks and maybe I can start with um, Jade and then um, Dr. Dabu. Okay, great. Um, thank you, Romina, and good afternoon to my fellow uh, panelists and the audience here and also the audience online. Um, I'm very happy to be here um, in celebration of the 60th anniversary of the IDB, but also very happy to be part of this conversation where we will talk about the collaboration and the developments between the IDB and our small countries. Um, so obviously the IDB also has a long-standing relationship with our small countries, um, but because of our size, we have different needs and we need um, a different approach towards our countries. Um, the IDB has been essential in sustainable growth for our smaller countries. Um, and the IDB has done extensive work and extensive research for this. But 
um, over the years, the IDB created um, mandates and commitments towards our smaller countries um, to really make a better contribution and to really um, have tailored support financially and also technical support for the smaller countries. But I'll give you a bit of a perspective. So the IDB has three arms. So we have the IDB that focuses on the public sector. Uh, we have the IDB Invest for the private sector, and we have the IDB Lab that was formerly our multilateral fund, uh, which also focuses on the private sector. Um, so we had to make individual commitments for all these three arms looking at our smaller countries. So we started uh, with the ninth general capital increase in 2010, where the IDB pledged 35% of its lending loans to the smaller countries. And then um, during the annual meeting in Busan in 2015, the IDB Invest um, agreed on 40% of operations within the smaller countries and the IDB Lab this year in 2019 um, developed a business plan especially for our smaller countries where we have a target between 35 and 40% for the smaller countries. But with, within the IDB Invest and the IDB Lab we also have like, a distinction between what we call small and island states, the SNI countries, where Suriname is part of the SNI countries. We have nine countries in these SNI countries, and these are all of the Caribbean countries. So it's Jamaica, Barbados, Bahamas, Guyana, Trinidad, Suriname, Belize, Haiti, and Dominican Republic, um, where the IDB Invest um, has a target for 10% um, for the SNI countries and the IDB Lab between 10 and 12%. So what does it all mean, right? So now we have all these commitments, we have all these mandates. Does it really help for development within our countries? Do we see, do we see any progress? So the, the answer is definitely yes. So there's a famous saying, right? Um, what gets measures gets done. So when you have these targets and KPIs in place, it really gives you focus and it, it gives you a set of, of, of details in where you want to go, how you want to go there, and what you need to do. Um, so we have definitely seen a lot of developments within our countries because we have these commitments in place. So now to put perspective in, um, to Suriname and the IDB, the, the, um, Suriname and the IDB have been working together for approximately 30 years. So we've seen um, a switch in, of, well, like, enhancement in collaboration between the IDB and Suriname after 2011 because of our, our new government and the mandates of our new government. So we have seen increased um, support technically and also financially, um, but also more knowledge and, and, and more um, collaboration between the IDB and, and Suriname. At that point for the, for the government of Suriname, policy reforms were really um, the most important part. So in our current um, country strategy between Suriname and the IDB, we focus um, especially on the modernization of our public sector, with a special focus on financial strengthening and also the energy sector. The IDB has have had tremendous um, um, major, it has developed Suriname in, 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 in different sectors and has made trem tremendous um, um, progress in that area but especially with, with our legislation. So we had a lot of outdated legislation on different areas in business climate, um, financial area, and also in, in our energy area. So the IDB helped support Suriname to update a lot of these legislations. And also um, a lot of them were approved in our parliament. So they were enacted to become real laws. But we do recognize that the IDB uh, made a lot of, makes a lot of um, difference and developments in Suriname in different sectors, but mostly um, education, health, agriculture, and energy. Uh, one of the positive things, I think, and which is very important for our, all our small countries is, that, is, the, is technical assistance with the IDB. So what we've seen in Suriname is that a lot of projects with the IDB come together with technical assistance. That is like, it's very essential and very important because we do need um, to strengthen our institutional capacity as well to be able to implement and execute all the projects as efficient and effective as possible. So definitely um, one of the, the um, positive points between our collaboration um, with the IDB. Another thing is that the IDB um, is a very well-known and very reliable partner in, in our region and in the developing world overall. So we've seen that it has also enabled Suriname to, to get more funds from, from different countries like China, Japan, um, the UK, um, but also in the region itself 
for example, the green climate funds and Caribbean um, investment facilities. Um, so because of the, the IDB is focused especially on Latin America and the Caribbean, it benefits our small countries as well. For Suriname, for example, we can learn from the successful um, projects that were executed in the rest of the Caribbean and also apply it in Suriname and also um, use lessons learned for any other, for any other projects. Um, and I think one of the main positive things with our collabor collaboration with the IDB is that we have physical presence. I think physical presence is of essence. So it's very good that the IDB has country offices in all our um, um, member countries or borrowing countries. Um, and what we've seen this year, which we see as an achievement for Suriname as well, is that now we also have people on the ground for IDB Invest and IDB Lab. Um, the, and, and better of it, there are people from Suriname. And why is this important for us in the private sector? I think Suriname is the only borrowing country that does not speak one of the official languages of the IDB, which, which we spoke about. Um, so for us in the private sector, it is very important to have local people on the ground to understand our private sector and to also be able to speak the language. So there has been a push for more decentralization yes. from headquarters. Yes, yeah. exactly. Um, so we are po very positive and very um, optimistic that this will help um, develop um, our private sector as well, because we do have a lot of potential. Um, and it, there was a, a a research done by the World Bank which said that 36% of the private sector firms say that lack of finance hinders um, private sector growth. So again, we are very happy um, with this, that we have this now. And this also came from the commitments being done by the IDB Lab and IDB Invest. We'll, we'll come back to this issue of uh, mobilizing um, you know, private sector resources. I wanted to turn to Juan Jose Dabu uh, to, you know, offer some uh, initial remarks. Thank you, Romina. Thank you, Dan, for the invitation. Um, I'm going to come from a little bit of a, a different angle. Um, the, I have been a client, uh, a governor, a shareholder, and a competitor, quote unquote, uh, uh, to the IDB. And um, also, the first annual meeting of the IDB took place in El Salvador in 1960. So it was founded in 59 in December, but the first board of directors, uh, where the first president was elected from Chile, uh, was in El Salvador in 1960. And I, and I mentioned this historical component because I think that the mission of the IDB um, has to an extent been achieved in terms of helping or contributing to accelerate the economic and social reforms of many of our countries. Uh, and I think compared to others, like uh, the World Bank, where I was, at least in Latin America, in El Salvador, uh, we always felt that the IDB was a little bit faster, a little, more, a little bit more uh, knowledgeable uh, in certain areas. And... Um, Many of the projects that we have uh, for ourselves, we, we will go, you know, many times first to, to the IDB. Having said that, I also think that as the world is changing, uh, so does the IDB needs to change, needs to adapt to a fast evolving world. And so, yes, it is important to remember have in mind a good inventory of all the things that have been achieved thus far, but I also think we also need to look uh, forward, uh, and, and, and that's a little bit of what Dan was making a reference to. We wrote a paper together where um, we, we, we need to think a little bit more um, aggressively in terms of the challenges that the clients, uh, the partner countries of the IDB have in Latin America and the Caribbean and be ready. Uh, uh, and in some areas, I think there's a lot of work that has taken place, but I think a little bit more needs to be done on areas such as the use of technology, uh, I think on the issue of adaptation to climate change uh, and different sources of energy. Uh, I think a little bit more emphasis needs to, be, needs to be put in place. And issues like good governance and the fight against It has derailed 
or slow down the progress that we can have, it's also something where an honest broker like the IDB uh, can play an even stronger role. And very important, uh, security. Uh, many of our countries, especially coming from Central America, uh, security, which at the end of the day is the main role, the main function of any government, is not to do a lot of things that governments do, and I was the Minister of Finance of mine, uh, but the main focus should be on security. And I'm talking about personal security, national security, and judicial security. And in that sense, I think there is an opportunity uh, to do more. And finally, on something that Jade mentioned, which is the role of the private sector, the participation of the private sector, because at the end of the day, poverty alleviation or poverty reduction, in my view, uh, will happen or will happen in a more accelerated way if we are able to create more jobs, private sector jobs. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, even though it might sound a little bit political, but IDB also needs to be ready for changes in Cuba and for changes in Venezuela. And if I think the BID can have um, a good role to play when those opportunities arise. Finally, in the case of uh, Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras, uh, because of the immigration issues that we are all very familiar with, I think that creating and developing more opportunities in our countries is one way of offering a better option to our citizens that, like in the case of my country, about 22% of our population lives here and about 16% of our economy depends on the remittances that are sent. That's all very important and very crucial. Uh, but, you know, as, as, as the current president of El Salvador has stated, why not creating the opportunities in the country so that Salvadorians uh, look first within the country uh, for those opportunities. So I think for many of our uh, small states in Latin America and the Caribbean, we can think big and should be aggressive in some of our goals, some which we can address sub-regionally, like in the case of Central America, we have done projects like CEPAC with the infrastructure of electricity throughout the Central American region. Uh, I think the cases of energy in the Caribbean are very crucial. We can work in that way, and, and I always, as I said before, as a client, as a governor, uh, I always saw in, and have seen the IDB a tremendous role on that. Thank you, Dr. Daboub. Um, Ambassador, I want to hear your perspective from uh, Barbados. Good afternoon. Uh, let me say, um, the last speaker said he didn't want to be political. I know nothing else but to be political. <laughs> Don't trust the issue of this label of ambassador. I, um, I think the moderator said I was a former minister of government. So I really come from a political background. And that's the only way I know how to put it, bluntly and frankly. Uh, let me take this opportunity, though, to congratulate and um, give sincere appreciation to the IDB for the partnership that they've had with the countries of the Caribbean that they've supported over the last um, half a century, the last 50 years. Um, Barbados, the Bahamas, Trinidad and Tobago, Jamaica and Guyana, we speak for them. Uh, they have done a sterling job in terms of helping us over the last 50 years to really build the, the, the infrastructure and the architecture that we needed to establish our countries for years to come. But ultimately, as you know, the role of the IDB as it relates to the development of our countries, in our opinion, has got to change. Um, the most difficult period that we ever faced in our lives, we are facing now. And this is because simply because of climate change. Now, there are people who don't want to accept the fact, and I will give you the bald facts. Um, if there was ever a wake-up call that we needed in terms of how we needed to react to, to the vulnerabilities that we face as small developing countries, particularly small island states, Dorian was that wake-up call. You've got 20% of a population displaced. You've got um, as much as Maybe there's going to take them about the Bahamas, about a decade to rebuild the two islands that have literally been lost in this system. And apart from that, you're also going to, it's going to take them about twice 
their GDP in one year to be able to rebuild this country. And therefore, uh, if there was ever a need for us to take a whole new different look at how we relate to the IDB and international financial institutions that help to finance our living, this is the time. Now, just to tell you, the, um, Barbados has been a beneficiary of much of the um, direction of the IDB over the past 50 years. Um, only in the, the last decade, Barbados went through some very difficult economic times. And we are now part and parcel of, a, of an IMF program, um, really consolidated into a program under what we call the Barbados Economic Recovery and Transformation Plan, the BERT program. And in that BERT program, we went to the IMF, and we've been meeting most of the targets that the IMF has upset. The IMF itself has changed, but we were recipients from the IDB of $100 million of SLD, SDL operation for Barbados in support of the broader efforts to stabilize our economy in November of 2018. So obviously we give full kudos to the IDB for all that they've done. But the IDB has been more into the region than you will ever think. For example, this region is highly vulnerable to external shocks, even as they seek to implement all the fiscal adjustments and debt consolidation programs and reforms to our business climate. Uh, for our tourism-based economies, the most important thing is going to be how our trading partners, the economies of our major, trade apart, major trading partners in Europe and in North America react. For commodity-dependent countries, obviously like Guyana and Trinidad, it's going to be um, how much the commodity prices, the movement of international commodity prices are going to affect them. Then the climate change and the threats to our national disaster is increasingly going to affect our macroeconomic situation over time. But the Caribbean is seven times more likely to be struck by a natural disaster, and the average cost is six times higher in terms of rebuilding than for a larger country. Now, the other thing that we face and constantly face is the constant reframing and resetting of goals as it relates to how we trade in terms of the rules for our own economic and financial survival. So you have the OECD blacklisting us for simply doing the things that other European countries do and states in the United States do in terms of being able to broker and to build strength in their own economies. And then there's obviously the issue of de-risking, uh, which is another issue that we face. And then there's the high rates of regional migration that we face. And if there was ever one, there's, there's one other thing, one other environmental issue, which is the issue of the sargassum seaweed issue that we face. If you want to destroy a tourism economy, and you, if you ever come out of your hotel room and you see all of this seaweed on the beach, you've actually come to the Caribbean for a pristine beach and for clear waters, and that's what you're finding. So um, just finally, to close in terms of my opening salvo, the four areas of emphasis that we believe that the IDB needs to really focus on in the next coming years, confronting the climate change challenge, first of all, and promoting environmental sustainability, seizing the opportunities that come out of the fourth industrial uh, revolution. As you know, this fourth industrial resolution has disrupted traditional business models and income streams, and the new technologies, in terms of artificial intelligence, for example, has created a basis where a lot of our small populations, uh, small workforces have been totally disrupted. Uh, we're going to have to look at new and emerging technologies, but also new and emerging professions to be able to move us ahead. Um, areas like, for example, culture and sports become major important areas of our development. And therefore, if you're going to monetize cultural activity, for example, visual artists, singers, athletes, or whatever, how do you get them on a plane? That we're going to have to use a lot of incubators in our own way to get them to move there. And the IDB has got to give us support. Um, someone told me today they didn't even know that Rihanna was from Barbados. Yes, Rihanna is from Barbados. And we're, and we're not saying that we have a thousand Rihannas in Barbados. I think we have two thousand. But 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 it means that we're going to have to look for other ways and means of financing our our future. The other area, obviously, is supporting the regional integration movement. We've talked a lot in the past about how we bring these islands together, but the integration of our capital markets, for example, reforms of our regional financial services architecture, and new competition policy has got to be a part and parcel of how we really, truly integrate these countries in the future. And that's where the IDB. And finally, 
um, promoting and transforming the private sector to play a more significant role in building our societies. In the past, we have been overly dependent on government, on the state, to be able to finance a lot of what we do. We must build a platform in which government becomes the facilitator, but we look for more small and medium-sized enterprises. Even the traditional private sector, as large as they are in some of our countries, have got to move to a point where we, where we create opportunities and systems that the IDB can support. So that's my opening salvo. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador. I now want to turn to Amario uh, from the perspective of Guatemala and more of you know Central America and the Northern Triangle. Dr. Dabu talked about migration challenges, um, you know, security, and you just uh, had an election and have a new brand, uh, new brand president. So yeah, if you can just yes. tell us about IDB. Thank you, Romina. I would like to start by thanking CSIS and the U.S. Chair at the IDB for this invitation. I would like also to start by you know, presenting a disclaimer. I mean, my points of view by no means represent the opinion of IDB or the government of Guatemala. I believe I'm going to play the role of a provocateur en chef, as you know, I would use you know, the Mayan you know, uh, way of measuring time you know, to present a perspective. Usually, you know, the big scheme, in the big scheme of things at Mayan, you know, the 20 year period is very important. So I'm going to start by you know, referring to 1999 and everything, you know, happens in a context. And the mission of, IDB, of the IDB makes sense if it delivers what is expected from it or not within that context. At the end of 1999, perhaps we were closing in Central America a period of time that was characterized by three main mega trends. The debt crisis, the Central America conflict, and uh, what I would say, you know, the macro instability of the region. So in that perspective, the IDB, I think that was right on target. We, uh, by means of engaging in uh, very important partnerships, namely the Club de Paris or, you know, the consultative group meetings, you know, I believe that uh, by those means, you know, Central America and the IDB, uh, who at the time I would say was a junior partner, you know, the IMF, the World Bank and the Treasury, I think we were able to, you know, to kind of, you know, resolve those issues, I would say, you know, in very good terms. So by the 1999, you know, years, everybody was looking forward to the FTAs, you know, the American Integration Initiative, you know, the Millennium Development Goals. And everybody was, you know, happy uh, to see that many countries, El Salvador, Guatemala, even Nicaragua, through elections, you know, we have like a post-peace process, you know, uh, life ahead. However, you know, within the next 20 years, uh, I believe that certain events did happen. You know, in the international arena, of course, uh, all that pertains to the 9-11, and other related events, but also at the, you know, at the national level, there was resistance to change. So basically, uh, key reforms like the fiscal reform or the administration of justice reform or the transparency and the corruption reform were either checked, you know, or partially accomplished. And hence, you know, we saw how, you know, narco traffics and other, you know, illegal activities started, you know, to really set crown in the region. Poverty has pretty much became endemic. And we have failed, you know, to integrate to the global supply, supply or production chains. So at this point of time, uh, we also face another issue, which is that many actors, stakeholders, you know, namely the World Bank, which has, you know, substantially diminished, you know, its allocations for Latin America, the IMF, you know, even Treasury and other donors pretty much, you know, disengaged, you know, and left, you know, uh, the, the region to its own devices pretty much. So the IDB, the IDB is front and central, you know, in terms of being, you know, like the main, you know, source of resources, you know, and also the main, I would say, international institutions, you know, to build partnerships around. But, you know, now in 2019, you know, what are the main challenges of Central America? Of course, you know, for wrestling, narco and illegal activities, you know, uh, groups, uh, promoting economic growth and employment, you know, the lackluster growth of the region has been really, you know, one of the main issues why we have such a, you know, such an amount of migration everywhere. Uh, we also need to, uh, you know, to continue revamping institutions, uh, particularly in the transparency and corruption area, like Dr. Dabu mentioned. And uh, very importantly, uh, although, you know, has been repeatedly, you know, brought to the picture, which is, you know, reducing poverty, but mostly managing our demography. Climate change has most to do about climate that has to do with demography. 
and sometimes you know most of our population are in rural areas or in highly exposed you know situations and that needs you know a particular approach having said that uh, i need to you know underscore that you know this increase in migration that we see it's you know indeed you know it's a uh, is a result of certain circumstances and not the cause. You know, the cause have been outlined by myself. And also I like to point that remittances have become, you know, a positive negative indicator of such an outcome. You know, everybody's happy about remittances, but we shouldn't. Actually, Central America is a is a machine of, you know, poverty production. And we have to say that that's the case. So what is the role of the IDB now? I mean, now that we have such an amount of, you know, former partners disengaging the region. Now that the, you know, exchange have become even more complex because at the time in 1999, or the period of 20 years that ended in 1999, for the multilateral development banks and other donors, it was quite simple. They went and deal with government, basically the executive, and some other, you know, business sector players. Now, when you're talking government, you're talking the judiciary, you're talking the legislative branch of government, not just the executive. You're talking private sector, not only you know the usual players. You're talking international actors. You're talking uh, you know SMEs and many other you know cooperatives, you know, and all the stakeholders that now have relevance. And when you're talking civil society, you're talking you know, a wide range of actors, from human rights activists, you know, to you know transparency and corruption, uh, to indigenous, and so many things. So the IDB has quite a challenge because you know he is the main institution left in the field. And now it has to, you know, to, you know, exert some leadership in terms of building, you know, a new way to deal with Central American program, project uh, issues and problems. I don't know if the CG meeting would be the case or the Paris, you know, group will be an example, but uh, needs to be done. You know, Central American countries cannot deal with such huge challenges, you know, like narco traffic or poverty on their own. I mean, we have had, you know, access, you know, to financial markets, even, you know, non I'll say investment countries have had access, you know, to, you know, to international resources, but that has only diminished also, you know, the influence of IDB and other multilateral organizations. So it's quite challenging, you know. So everybody's expecting things, but what is there, you know, is, is you know, an extreme complex. So perhaps what I would like to suggest, or beg to suggest rather, is that the IDB should actually, you know, streamline, you know, and try to be very, very, careful with what it does, you know, and how it does it. Uh, I concur with Ambassador Anderson and Ambassador Dabud, you know, regionalization integration is of the essence, particularly for Central America. I mean, there's no way out without regionalization. And by that, I mean, you know, regional institutions that you know, have legal weight and are in some kinds and in some, you know, uh, domains, uh, I would say, vinculantes, uh, binding. I mean, we have CFPAC, but we don't have a, re a regional energy market that actually operates and functions. So it's like we have the infrastructure, but we don't have the market. We all know that we need integration, but we have very poor, you know, uh, customs agents, you know, and, and border, you know, facilities. So that type of thing, I believe, should be, you know, front and center of, in the IDB's agenda. What else? Uh, institutions. You know, we cannot deal with fragile institutions nowadays. We need to... I'm going to finish soon. You said you would streamline the exactly. activities. So, so you're I'm saying, adding more. <laughs> no, no. I'm, I'm actually, I'm, I'm dealing with basically two things, you know, regional integration, institutions, infrastructure, and logistics. That would be it. I mean, and that's quite a challenge. Thank you, Mario. I wanted to come back to the issue of, um, you know, there's a big push for uh, funding the SDGs through private capital and um, I wanted to talk about how do we how does IDB help countries mobilize private capital and not only you know foreign capital but how can we mobilize more of our internal resources and I know Dr. Dabu you were instrumental in um, you know leading the El Salvador to investment grade and how how have you done that and what benefits you know in terms of this private capital mobilization, if you could talk a little bit about that and why that is so important. So I think the first thing is that for capital to come, they need to understand the risks. And uh, what tends to happen is that we want others to do certain things for us. And we need to do the homework ourselves, mm -hmm. the countries themselves. 
So El Salvador is a country that went from hardship to investment grade in a relatively short period of time. We had a war where 5% of the population got killed, some large percentage at the time, 10 or 12% of our population migrated to the United States, infrastructure, 90% of it totally destroyed, and zero credibility in the international community. In 1992, we signed a peace agreement. By 1998, that's six years later, El Salvador was investment grade. How we did it? Well, we stopped blaming others for the problems that were ours. We started to open up our economy and did the homework that some countries, like Chile, for example, uh, and others had, had done. And by the year 2000 and 2001, in the Doing Business Report, which was in the early stages, the Index of Economic Freedom, the Competitiveness Indicator, El Salvador beat Chile, South Korea, Germany, France, Spain, you name it. Uh, that's not to say that we were already Singapore or we were already uh, a, a developed country, but we were in the path. At that time, the investments that came to the country were in record numbers. Mm -hmm. The growth of the country was also in record numbers. So part of the answer to your question is, yes, we need more players like the private sector arm of the IDB or the, the IFC from the World Bank. But more importantly, we need private sector investors that believe in the rules of the game, in the rule of law, and that their investments will actually function. They will be able to repatriate capital, etc. So it takes two to tango. It takes for the governments and for the countries to uh, create the conditions, to enable the conditions to attract the private sector. And then it does take the role of institutions like the IDB to uh, help mitigate some of the risks that are always present through financial instruments, but also through the credibility that, for example, the IDB gives. With that, what you minimize is the risk, for example, of misusing resources or creating conditions for, for corruption. So we have a project in El Salvador, for example, of natural gas uh, to generate some 350 megawatts, uh, megawatts of electricity. It's one of the first that's going to be in, in Central America. Panama already has one. Uh, and the private sector arm of the World Bank came and created a little bit of the conditions to attract mm -hmm. other investors from the private sector. That's a project that could have not been done exclusively by government, and sans God, it was not attempted to be done by the government, and could not have been done exclusively with resources from the private sector, because you need OPIC, you need uh, IDB Invest or IFC to give uh, conditions of security to the private sector investors that the rules of the game will not change or will not change very often. And so that's how I see the private sector coming to our countries. Uh, local investors and international investors if you have, if you create the conditions for that to happen. Yeah, but I, I've heard, uh, you know, one of the things that, that we that we are certainly much against, if, even when you take full responsibility for your actions, as the doctor has said, and even when you try to get your macroeconomic housing order, there are serious risks to people investing, the private sector investing, because of all the vulnerabilities that we face. And I think that we have not, many people have not looked seriously at these vulnerabilities and sought to deal with them. For example, by the, by the, the IDB brings credibility when they are playing in our space to, to where we can go. But you know, one of the things that we have been, we've become also the victims of our own successes we've been excluded from concessionary funding, for example, by the metrics that they measure, even trying to get your hands on, on funding. When you do have your housing order, it's difficult for us because whenever we do get to investment grade, people then say, well, you know, you're vulnerable to all these externalities, to hurricanes and external shocks and everything else. And then we, we, we so it's like, a, it's like a vicious cycle that we're in. And we've got to uh, not only get our own housing order, but we've got to convince the international investment community that we are not as risky as they believe we are, and therefore that these the IDB and other players 
need to play more the World Bank in our space than they're playing now. Now, if I may, I would just like to highlight a couple of issues. Number one, the rating agencies uh, indicate that one of the main risks of investing in Central America has to do with lack of proper institutionality and you know, transparency and corruption. So uh, I, won't, I must insist that that is a, you know, a fundamental agenda. And in terms of you know, infrastructure and logistics, uh, Guatemala is the number of five exporters or exporter in, in the sugar market, or used to be. But you know, for the audience to know, you know, Australian sugar producers, you know, can enter the market in the U.S. You know, transport-wise, you know, at a, at a lesser cost, you know, than Guatemala. You know, we're just around the corner of the U.S. market, and yet the Australian sugar producers, you know, have better conditions. So that's just to give you an example, uh, because we like to suggest that we have a privileged, you know, uh, location, but we don't. I mean, it's a matter of you know how good our infrastructure and logistics uh, are, and they're they're failing big time. So we're close to the market. But, you know, even Australians, you know, the, the other side of the Pacific can, in terms of, uh, you know, a commodity. Uh, now that the, if you're pointing at technology and industri industrial production, global chains, you know, you need even better infrastructure. So that's one of the main challenges, I would say, you know, to, you know, to lure investors, you know, high quality investors. And I would add that that's why I think it's very crucial for our small countries to really work together and use the IDB in that context as well. Because we, we, we do um, face the same challenges. Um, our economies are not very diversified. Um, and, and what the ambassador was saying about um, external shocks. So we've also seen what we have been able to do together, um, looking at the mandates that we created within the IDB. So I really think that if we bundle together that we can make um, better steps um, in, with, with this. Is ZIDB Invest uh, active in Suriname? Are they um, helping attract, you know? Uh, so that's, that's uh, I don't know if I mentioned it. So that's one of the achievements yeah. that we have, right? So we have, we have people on the floor now. So now we, we're not active right now, but okay. we have had, um, I think, two or three um, projects with the IDB Invest, which did help us um, to collaborate with different institutions in the region and help us export. Um, with the, in the company that they held um, to, to the region, to the Caribbean countries. Mm -hmm. Yes, Mario. No, sorry, but okay. there's a very important domain in which the IDB has been active and the Central Americans and other countries, you know, really, you know, geared towards, and that is, you know, the public-private partnerships market, the P3 market. And again, you know, transparency and corruption, you know, a working, you know, justice uh, system is of the essence in order to and again, going back to the infrastructure projects, which could be, you know, the first batch of really interesting projects, then again, you need scale. And this is why integration is of the essence. Mm -hmm. you, know, you need to have a, a regional portfolio. Otherwise, you know, big investors, you know, even Guatemala, which is one third of the regional GDP and one third of the population, it's not even interesting, you know, for big investments. So this is a role that IDB, you know, can play, you know, be central in terms of, you know, try of developing, you know, this type of, you know, pipelines, you know, portfolios and regional institutions. Yes. One more addition. So this is for the Caribbean region. We have a very um, um, under-researched like, um, um, Caribbean. Like, there's not a lot of research done in the Caribbean. Let me say it that way. Um, that was my next question on the knowledge. Building. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, what we see that even though um, if you have academic papers or working papers that focus on Latin, and, Latin America and the Caribbean, you would see that research um, is excluded based on the Caribbean countries. Like even within the IDB, um, if we have publications, you would see that it's not um, specifically focused on um, the specific um, situation in the Caribbean. So that so we lack a lot of um, valuable data. Yeah, part of the challenge is collecting the data. Um, I worked on projects uh, in the past and getting data from the Caribbean is yes. really hard. And yes. that's an area where, you know, the MDBs and the regional development banks could work together even with, you know, UN organizations to collect data. So what I've heard before as well in the IDB is because we do like that information and because we didn't have um, physical presence before, like even with the IDB Invest, for example, that the multilaterals and the IDB did not understand what kind of potential we have. Yes, we have different economies of scale, but there is potential. So we really need that data. Um, in order, and also like for the public sector, of course, because we need data to make um, good policies, to create and develop good policies. So that's a, a big issue for us. 
Yeah. Um, I don't know if anybody, I mean, that was my question on advancing, you know, knowledge, how, how has the IDB helped, you know, in, in uh, data collection and research. And that's like an area that I think still needs uh, more work in, in these small states. Um, another area I would point out is, you know, we, we spoke about private sector, um, private capital mobilization, but um, levels of taxation, you know, in, in the Central America and um, levels of mobilizing local savings. We always talk about bringing the, you know, foreign investors, but um, what are we doing in terms of mobilizing local savings, um, you know, bond markets, which could uh, um, finance, you know, urbanization. A lot of these, um, at least Central America is, is urbanizing fast. Uh, the rest of Latin America has already urbanized, but how can we develop, um, you know, many of the, these countries do not have uh, developed capital markets. And that's an area maybe that, you know, the IDB could, you know, be a leading partner. So um, I don't know if you have any, I'd like to ask you, I, some, some of you already um, laid out some of your thoughts in terms of what would you like the IDB to do more of in the future? Um, you know, maybe if you could just say, you know, if you had to uh, pick one thing, uh, what, what would that be? Uh, what difference in approach or topic uh, would, would you like the IDB to do more in your small states? And, you know, you can um, repeat what you said, but just one, one thing. Juan Jose, you mentioned a, a lot of things, but so I think to be consistent with what I said before, I think the, the most important role is not necessarily the money uh, that, that can be you know, provided to our countries, but that role of an honest broker that can bring uh, many to the table because there is not enough money out there yeah. for any one entity to, to help do everything. And, and there shouldn't be. At the end of the day, it's for each of the countries, in line with what I said earlier, to create the conditions to to bring in to crowd in uh, more participation uh, uh, from the private sector, and I'm talking about all size of companies from the small and medium sized enterprises to, to 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 very large companies. There is one thing, however, that we haven't hasn't been mentioned that much. Mm -hmm. Mario did mention it a little bit, which I think is important: is high quality infrastructure, because there can be all kind of infrastructure provided by many sources, which at the end of the day not only don't do the work that is needed, but delays progress at the same time. Thank you. Um, I would say um, technical assistance, I think that is very important and to, to build and develop our institutional capacity, private and public sector. <laughs> well, uh, debt crisis, macro adjustment, peace process, I mean, the region had an agenda, and we were able to deal with it. But that was, I would say, a stabilization agenda, not a change agenda. And at the time, again, I must insist, you know, there were different outfits, whether the Club de Paris or, you know, the consultative group meeting that brought many stakeholders together, including governments, you know, to define an agenda. Central America is lacking an agenda nowadays. And I don't believe local governments can deal with, again, you know, certain challenges. And we don't have that many, you know, external stakeholders still or remain engaged with the region. So whichever is there, you know, in governments, IDB and other actors, I need, we need to, you know, really outline a regional agenda, which is more proactive and strategic along the lines of, of the issues I, I, I suggested. Mine would be um, climate change, confronting the climate change challenges that we have and promoting really environmental sustainability. I don't think that people understand how really serious this is for our region. As I said, Dorian was the ultimate wake up call. But when you look across our countries and our, every year we just sit and wait for a hurricane or some system to pass through and to hit us. And I believe that, that we need more ex ante building resilience and mitigation against natural disasters than ex post financing for when it does happen. If we, we've got like $9 billion in private capital in, in, in savings for people across the region of the Caribbean, and it's not being mobilized into any sustainable fund to be able to deal with issues of mitigation, or if we are struck, how do we do it? But whenever you hit by a hurricane, four things essentially happen. You There's excessive flooding, 
there's loss of infrastructure, particularly personal housing. There is there are issues of loss of power because most of our utilities are above ground and they need to be below ground. They need to be buried. And then the other issue is, uh, how do you rebuild? Where do you, where do you start to, to accumulate funds to start the rebuilding process? And I'm saying, if the IDB could do anything in that regard, we've got to be able to, like for example, Holland is, 90% of Holland is below sea level. And they've not had a major flooding incident since 1953. And the reason for that is that the way they have designed their floodplains and what they've done has been able to get them, because Katrina, for example, and what happened in, in, in New Orleans could never happen in Holland because of the West design. And I'm simply saying we're bringing in an expert, but it's going to be costly to be able to do this in over a period of time. That's where the IDB needs to be, to be, to be relevant and needs to be in there. We need to bury all of our utilities. And while we're down there, not only are we burying electricity cables and whatever, we're dealing with a lot of our countries are water scarce, even though we're surrounded by water, and we lose a lot of our water to the ground because a lot of our mains have been down there since the time of Queen Victoria in England. And therefore, we, we don't get anything out of them. And then, basically, the other issue, as I said before, is housing stock. We need, across the region, to have a common code, building code, because there are still buildings that are standing in Abaco and Grand Bahama because of the way in which they were designed. And therefore, if you, if you have a common building code across the region to build resilient um, infrastructure, well, then you're on. And finally, obviously, mobilizing the funds that we've got in all that private capital. Because if you're going through any type of um, structural adjustment program or fiscal consolidation program, you're not going to see you, you, your domestic economy is, is constricted a lot. And you don't see a lot of private capital inflows from your own domestically, or you don't see a lot of foreign direct investment. So therefore, you've got to have partners like the IDB to be able to partner with us to move us to the next level. Thank you. Uh, thank you. David Lewis with Manchester Trade and CSIS. Uh, congratulations from Mina and the panel. Excellent uh, timing. Uh, on the bad side, unfortunately, as Ambassador has said, given the series of regional natural disasters and so on affecting small islands in the Caribbean, but also the timing with regards to the IDB's 60th anniversary. I'm interested if uh, any, all of you would care to comment, particularly on, you've sort of skirted around the issue of foreign direct investment, but also national investment in development initiatives in the countries, and particularly how we're seeing some countries really mobilize that very well. Uh, in a climate, I agree with Ambassador, not just of dearth of development assistance, but also uh, maturation in certain markets. So for example, we have extremely high growth rates and developed markets in places like Jamaica, Dominican Republic, uh, and it's really all led by foreign direct investment and national uh, investment, private capital. Um, El Salvador now owns Avianca, a business person in El Salvador bought out Avianca. Uh, Chile and Colombia, the number one FDI investors in Central America. It's not the US, it's not Europe. It certainly isn't China, despite, despite everything we hear. So I'm interested if you'd comment a bit on private sector investment, both foreign, but also the growth of national capital that's investing in markets in Central America, in CAFTA, which is now for a business person, one market. It's not five markets, it's one market if you're in business. So something along that line. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, there was a gentleman. Yes, the, um, the gentleman here. So we'll take two questions, answer them, and then a second round. Hello, uh, Kevin Murphy with J. Austin Associates, and I'm working with a group led by Harvard Business School and Michael Porter in Guyana to advise leaders there with regard to the oil revenues will be transformative for that country. So my question may be especially directed at Jade, but also to others, is that uh, we've also seen that people who think about competitiveness 
think that small countries actually have an advantage, maybe because they can move quicker. If you look at a lot of the small countries like Ireland and Singapore, they managed to get out in front. So how, what have you found at the IDB or in your respective countries that tends to show that hmm, small countries can really be more competitive than larger countries? And what, what have the findings been there? Uh, and especially with regard to Suriname, uh, what are your competitive advantages uh, relative to, say, French Guyana or Guyana or some of the other neighboring countries? Are there some distinctive competencies there that we could all learn from as a small country? Thank you. So uh, let's answer these two questions, and then I'll um, refer to the audience again. Um, take a stab at David's uh, question on how to mobilize more, uh, you know, local and, I guess, regional private capital. Well, I, I, I think David's question is a good question, but obviously I think the doctor said, Juan uh, Jose said, at the beginning of this, um, beginning of this exercise, you've got to take responsibility for your own internal um, economic actions. Um, I, I, that, that's where it begins. That's where it begins. But for example, Barbados went through a very difficult period in which we were downgraded some 23 times by the international uh, rating agencies. I mean, if Moody's and Standard & Poor's down, downgrades you where your government paper is basically is not worth anything. I mean, who is really going to seek to invest in your country? Private capital inflows are not going to happen. Your people are trying to get their money out and there's no confidence in the economy. Where, how are you going to get it in order? And I'm saying it's going to be painful, but the, the adjustment period that we're going through now, which we hope to reduce substantially our debt, uh, in which we are, our macro framework is really in order, is really where it begins. And because I, I, I understand the concept about small countries being nimble, but, but, when you, but how do you compare Barbados to Singapore? I've heard these, these crazy comparisons. Excuse my French. Yeah, Barbados cannot be Singapore. I mean, you, you, the, the, the political frame is totally different to begin with. So when you hear these outlandish statements about what, what Singapore has become, if you look at the Malays Federation and you know how Singapore was formed, being kicked out of the Malays Federation and what Lee Kuan Yew said, and how they were able to reform, but that's basically a semi-totalitarian country. That's not a totally democratic country in its own right. And I say that not disparagingly, but that's the fact. And therefore, if you expect a Barbados to be ever able to form a country, to create a country like that, and then if you look at where they're located, they're the perfect bridge for the rest of what was formerly the Malays Federation. So you can't, you can't have that. I'm saying get your macro house in order. Go through the pain that you need to go through in terms of fixing all, all, all of your fiscal issues. And then talk about seeking some partners like the IDB, for example, in terms of being able to reconstruct your infrastructure and give us access to concessional um, financing because we are still vulnerable. Instead of, instead of trying to state that China has access to concessional financing at the World Bank, Barbados doesn't. You, you, you can't just take the size of my GDP, divide it by the number of people I've got living in Barbados and tell me that's the, that's the crisis and the metric that you use for seeing whether or not I'm, I can access funding. And therefore, it means that you've got to find another index of vulnerability or something X else that tells us what we can do. But, that, but, but that's how you start. Yes, Jade. Um, to answer your question, I think Suriname and the other small countries do have a lot of advantages and I can name a lot of them, I think. <laughs> um, but the IDB, for example, can use the small states and in this case Suriname for, for smaller scale innovative um, um, projects. So if we see, we talk about the whole new technology boom in where you can use a country like Suriname having only 600,000 people to try out certain projects on a smaller scale and to then further um, um, engage in them with the bigger countries. But in Suriname, looking at um, our position, one of the advantages is definitely trade. We have a good um, trade um, deals with, especially with, with, with the Netherlands, with Europe. So we are one of the countries in the area, in the region that has di a direct link with Europe, which can be used by the other countries as well. Um, and we can definitely use um, a country like Suriname in the, in the surface sector a lot. 
uh, we have a high literacy rate of like 94% in Suriname. So in that area, we can also still make advantages um, of um, like using that within the IDB, within the whole region and towards the rest of the region outside um, the LAC region um, to gain advantages um, in that area. Um, there was one. Um, so we have 600,000 people approximately in Suriname and we have 93% of the country that is still Amazon and is still forest. So we can be, that, that's also a big advantage for us to use in, in either agriculture, um, so yeah, I, I don't know if that answered your questions on, or if you were talking about different things with oil in, in particular. I just wanted to um, tell David and the audience, we are also working on, um, on a paper on financial guarantees to mobilize local capital markets and FDI. So stay tuned because part of the answer will be there. Uh, but Mario wanted to yeah, introduce. Yes. Perhaps Central America has been dealing with the chicken and egg issue, which is we need good infrastructure, we need capable human resources, and yet we don't have them because we have very, very weak fiscal systems. So 20 years later, after the peace accords, I guess that the chicken and egg issue may be resolved by really dealing with the fiscal issue. And by fiscal, I'm not only meaning taxes, I'm meaning you know, transparency and corruption and quality of investments and expenditures. We have failed to do so in Central America, and hence, you know, we still have to offer, you know, big investors, you know, with quality of infrastructure and human resources. I mean, we cannot, you know, promote what is not there. So I think that the first step should be fiscal, and that's where the IDB can really play a role. And this is where regionalization makes sense because, you know, you know, TVAs and many other things, you know, if you're talking customs unions and many other things, should be. You know, okay. And by the way, you know, Avianca is soon to be owned by United. <laughs> Just two, two quick comments. Uh, as per David's question, um, I think we lost a couple of uh, revolutions, you know, the Industrial Revolution and others. I think uh, this time with technology, there is no excuse to take advantage uh, of, of technology and try to uh, enhance and improve uh, the kind of investments that are attracted to our countries. In the particular case of El Salvador, and I'll speak for myself, uh, we are in business, my family has several businesses in, in Central America, mainly in El Salvador, and for 10 years, we went somewhere else for new investments because the conditions were not there in the country. So you need to have an environment that is conducive to at least identifying the risks so you know how to mitigate them. and then you also need, as I mentioned earlier, to partner with an entity that can give you a little bit more muscle when you have to challenge some uh, actors in, in our society. In terms of Michael Porter, we had him helping us between 1996 and 1999, uh, and he helped us a lot. And we took some people, including to India, to learn about the white, or to be prepared for the white 2 k uh, and created, uh, took them to the technology development parts as per the advice we got. So it is very useful when you have a pro-private sector and pro-growth um, environment to bring these new, or at the time, new ideas and concepts so that we can uh, encourage uh, even uh, more investment. When I became a minister of finance, there were 115 different taxes. Mm -hmm. Nobody knew what they were. <laughs> Nobody was collecting really the money that was supposed to be collected. We simplified it to three. Mm -hmm. And if I would have had more time, we would have probably gone to one to make it simpler. And the tax base went from about 11% to now close to 18%. So without, in my time, because after that, it changed, but we didn't raise taxes, we didn't increase taxes, and we had uh, more resources coming to the government. And we also had a reform in the pension sector to create that secondary market that can allow for all the privatizations that were taking place to actually uh, uh, create a deeper, other than reportos, uh, market for, for, for in the financial sector. So I guess in part to address the two questions, yes, uh, and we need to attract more the private sector, but it's about the conditions and identifying the proper levels of risk. The investors are not afraid of risk. They are afraid of the unknown risks. Thank you. Thank you, Don. 
group. I see more hands. Um, Mark Lopez here and uh, the gentleman here. Uh, oh, and the gentleman here. Hi, hi, I'm Mark Lopez. I'm with a New York tech company and also with the CSIS uh, advisor here and was with the IDB uh, US office until last year. Um, next year, there will be a new president of the IDB. Um, Jade, you mentioned the um, uh, ninth capital increase from 2010 ended about 2015. Presumably the next president of the IDB will be looking at a capital increase. Um, from your perspective for these issues, uh, how much? when and uh, and for what uh, so just an easy question for you all to uh this is all off the record of course that everyone respects thank you oh hello good evening everyone i'm from panama gabriel soto i'm a, I'm a software engineer student um i have a question about what's your opinion about improving the government efficiency using automation programs and AI. Studies say that they could make process faster and more reliable. But how do you prepare the government as well as the population? If current education programs in Latin America and the Caribbean aren't preparing our students to be more competitive vis-a-vis -vis with um, during the fourth, industri fourth industrial revolution, how does the IDB can make our countries more capable, more competitive, and more attractive to investments. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, my name is Sidney Carley. I'm the ambassador from the Bahamas. Um, I'd just like to say uh, that Ambassador Lynch from Barbados uh, put the question of climate change, adaptation, resilience, and, and rebuilding uh, for the entire region. But as you know, the Bahamas just had a, a serious hit by the latest superstorm. Uh, uh, two years ago, uh, Dominica, Antigua, and Barbuda, and Puerto Rico went through the same thing, and the Bahamas. Uh, one of the islands in the Bahamas, the island of Ragged Island, which was hit by uh, Maria, uh, is still devastated with no inhabitants. Uh, one of the issues for small island developing states, uh, not only in the Caribbean, but in the, in the Pacific, that are prone to superstorms and natural disasters is not so much that you can build for resilience, either ex ante or ex post facto, uh, but you have to constantly rebuild. And a, a country like the Bahamas with 700 islands, uh, every year, one of those islands are going to get hit. Uh, it's just, uh, it's the safest, safest bet if you were a betting man, it's the safest bet. One of them are going to get hit because the track of the storm coming off of Africa through the Caribbean is bound to hit one of our islands. And so the question is, a high income country, uh, which the World Bank has designated the Bahamas, uh, capital GDP, getting hit, having one or more of the islands completely devastated, dehumaned, no, no one living there, all the structures are gone, and having to rebuild two or three years later every time with the additional problem of being designated a high-income country uh, is a challenge for small island developing states. And it is something, it's a new normal, and it's something that financing, uh, international financial organizations are gonna have to take a second look at. My second point is foreign direct investment, F FDI. Bahamas uh, attracts or has a slew of legislation to try to attract foreign direct investments. In recent times, we have been discovering that foreign direct investors are no longer coming with billions of dollars to invest in your country. They are coming looking for concessions in the form of uh, tax breaks or grants in public land, and they take that and they go back to the international community to leverage for financing, or they issue an IPO and go on, on the stock exchange. 
So the traditional way of attracting foreign direct investment where foreign capital comes in, new money comes in and help to develop the country, that's no longer happening. They're coming to bargain and they're bargaining for high stakes and they're creating political problems in the country because the inhabitants are saying, you're already giving all this uh, concessions and crown land and other lands to the foreign direct investment, which ordinarily in the Caribbean, uh, the inhabitants don't benefit from. So that's another issue. Uh, you can attract foreign direct investment, uh, but it, there's some political backlash a lot of time, and, it, and, and the groundswell is coming. Finally, I, I know I have a lot to say. Finally, I, I, I like the fact that uh, Ambassador Lynch mentioned the de-risking and the EU and a lot of the blacklisting because compounded with the small island developing stage problems, you have the issue of the big countries, particularly in the EU, EU I'm sure there are some EU countries here, uh, the OECD, um, putting the, the tax regime that they maintain in the EU, which is foreign to Caribbean countries and small island developing states, uh, and holding you to a standard, sometimes a double standard, which those countries themselves are not adhering to, and forcing you to comply, especially in your financial services industry, which is a big part of these economies, to comply and to compete unfairly. Thank you. There are three questions here, capital increase, the FOIA IR and skilling, and this issue of FDI. Um, maybe Juan Jose, you want to go first? Well, first of all, uh, to, Mr. to the ambassador from the Bahamas, our condolences for what your country is going through and for the loss of lives. Uh, El Salvador experiences this also very often. We had mm -hmm. Nietzsche in 99, then two earthquakes in 2001, in January and in February 13 of 2001, where one third of the country was lost. Mm -hmm. So when I went to the World Bank, one of the things we created was the catastrophe fund. This is an insurance, and you are part of it. Uh, that triggers an algorithm the moment the storm starts. So you can have some of the early resources to help in saving lives and eventually in improving livelihoods for the people. It does need the participation of the countries a little bit more aggressively in that scheme, in that format, but it's one of the tools that I think can facilitate or can help alleviate some of the situations. Now, to prevent a little bit or to be ready is more about adapting it's more about adaptation to climate change. In 2010, I had the honor of founding the Global Adaptation Institute, which is a non-for-profit, based, was based here in DC, now is based at the University of Notre Dame. We have developed an index that is being used by the rating agencies, is used by uh, private companies to measure how vulnerable countries are and how enable is the environment to attract investment, to invest in those vulnerabilities that countries have. And companies like Caterpillar, Cargill, Coca-Cola, Nestle, many of the infrastructure company, all of the insurance companies are using this tool in order to identify, because the disgrace that some of our countries face with natural disasters and others is an opportunity for some investments to take place. And when you are rebuilding, to rebuild with the conditions that will prevent next time. So you build 50 centimeters higher, or you build where in a community in particular, at least one of the houses has to be two meters taller so that you can have in there the uh, medicine, or you can have in there the radio. So, so there are uh, several initiatives out there that with the proper financing and not only with the government, but also with some participation from the private sector, can be done to mitigate, to uh, prevent, or to minimize the impact of some of the effects that you were describing. And this is just taking one part of, of your question, the one that has to do with uh, how to be ready or how to react quickly when natural disasters strike. And you said it, all of our countries, with some rare exceptions, will face this year one or two events. Now, uh, uh, Gabriel asked something also very important 
uh, related to the use of technology. And I, 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 I mentioned that as actually was the first point I made that we need to use technology more. I am an engineer by formation, an industrial engineer. So when you ask about making the government more efficient as an industrial engineer, the first thing I do is I eliminate first what doesn't work and what is not needed. And then what is left is what you try to make it as efficient as possible. What happens in some of our countries, and Panama is not an exception, uh, is that we have grown too much and we are, you know, sort of addressing the flavor of the month and we sometimes forget the most basic and important uh, functions that the state has, which was said in part before by the, by the ambassador, which is the government should be not an orchestra director, but a referee that helps facilitate the, or resolve the conflicts among the different actors of society. And two, the security part, which I also mentioned before. Not that the other areas, there is no role for the government. Of course, there is a subsidiary role for the government for vulnerable groups in society. So in order to use, in order to become more efficient, the use of technology is extremely important and it has to be applied to the minimum expression that a government needs in order to create the conditions for people to take destiny into their own hands. So I am all in favor of investing more in technology, but there is some surgery that needs to take place in most of our countries to reduce the excesses that we still have. Um, to first address the ambassador of Bahamas' question, is the IDB has contingent credit facilities as, as well with, with the different Caribbean countries where we are able to react right away after disaster hits. We always say, like, whenever we approve these projects, this is the first time we, we never hope to use this, this actual project. Um, so that's one of the things we do have in place for our um, most of the Caribbean countries. Um, and what um, Ambassador Dabup is saying, uh, we really need sustainable infrastructure. Uh, you would, it, it's awful to see the difference in how our countries, usually like the poor and the smaller countries are not able to adapt right away after such disaster. Like if you also in Haiti, if, if disaster strikes, it takes a longer time um, for them to cope with, with all the new infrastructure and, and all like to get everything together again. So that is, um, one of the things we have in place um, with the IDP. I don't know, if you, should I answer the rest of the questions? And um, that's, up, that's up to you. <laughs> OK, yeah. Uh, <laughs> concerning Mark, Mark, thank you for your question and comment. I, I agree with you totally. I think this is the time um, for us as small countries to really think about the what, when, and how because of the switch of a precedent. It's time for us. So if you look at when now, we need to start um, how with a dialogue between our countries and okay, what is it we really need? And today we've heard on this table um, what some of the most prominent issues are and challenges in our small states. So I think we really need to start with that dialogue, intensive dialogue, and what we'd, would we expect from this new management and this new president and what would we want out of it and and again as a country only as Syria now we will never be able to to get like what we really want or need so we really need to bundle together and figure out um, what we want to gain um, from that new prospect um, coming so so that's like the, the what when and how yeah go ahead uh, I would just like to clarify a a previous comment I made because I don't want to come across as a statist or old-fashioned, you know, like state-prone, you know, bureaucrat. Actually, I come from a business sector. But what has been happening, and that refers to the question, you know, in Central America and Mesoamerica by at large, you know, we pretty much lost, you know, the opportunity, you know, to jump into the train of the third industrial revolution. And now we're losing the opportunity to jump into the fourth. Why? Because the ticket, you know, to those ships that are about to sail or have already sailed is, you know, proper human resources, you know, educated population, you know, health, nutrition, and good infrastructure. And we have failed to do our homework. And this is why, you know, we have this sometimes, you know, like uh, a little bit of schizophrenic, you know, approach, because, you know, we have sometimes, you know, very sophisticated sectors of the economy, you know, and certain populations who know about many things, but the vast majority is really lagging behind. And this is why if Central America, you decide to go ahead and make an investment in rural areas nowadays, you know, go ahead and good luck, you know, because we have such an amount of social demands that are turning radical now that I don't know how to deal with that. And I do, which is, you know, you really need to do your homework, you know. 
we have not failed to do our homework. And this is where the IDB should be, you know, paying attention yeah. before, you know, talking about, you know, big issues and going to the moon. I mean, there are still people lacking, you know, proper. You know, we we underperform in many of the, you know, PISA studies, for example. So how can you adopt, you know, higher technology if you don't have the basic numerical or literacy skills? Um, Just want to add like a quick thing, but also like uh, we need to like, in our governments realize that um, investment in education is very important. So uh, Suriname has one of the highest um, percentage in GDP investing in education, like approximately 5%. But I think we need to do more in that case to also not um, miss this opportunity to go along with the fourth industrial um, revolution. Evolution. <laughs> yes. I'm, I'm happy to hear that there's actually a vulnerability index that we can utilize that is there. I, I, we've been talking about this for a long time in the Caribbean. This is the first time I've ever heard anyone say that there is an active index that we can actually use. But, yeah, it's, it's for free, uh, even better. But um, I, I've heard um, lots of talk about putting your house in order. And yes, you need to put your house in order. But I'm also going to remind the rest of the developed community, the small island states that ours, you know, sometimes they think that we're invisible, you know. You're a small state, we're invisible, we're not indispensable. It might be invisible to some. But I also want to say this, that um, the development of small societies is also important to the development of large and already developed societies and your ongoing development. If, if you, if they don't assist in seeking to have the people on their borders well developed, all of the downsides of that development will end up on your doorstep at the border. Just remember, at the border, we are not indispensable. And many large states, even in this hemisphere, seem to think that small states like ours are invisible. We're not. Um, we have a few minutes left. I want to maybe take just one last question and then we have an announcement yeah the gentleman here uh, thank you all Tim docking from the refugee investment network a very good panel uh, forced displacement was an issue you're probably all familiar with this we've talked about it through natural disaster um, in the course in Central America um, you know you know it very well um, but some of your countries are moving from source countries to host countries uh, quite quickly uh, these days. And I'm wondering, um, what can the bank do? Um, uh, President uh, Moreno has uh, put a nice innovation in place, I think the $100 million migration grant fund, is, but it's just a start. In particular, what, what could the bank do to help with policy reform? I'm, from what I see from the region, a lot of uh, countries are just unprepared for this wave of people that are being generated from countries like Venezuela, from uh, Central America, from these disasters. Thank you. I think politicians should stay out of these things. Uh, the issue of, of what can the bank do, obviously we don't have the infrastructure, first of all, to be able, ne neither the size nor the infrastructure to start to accommodate many of the, the influx of people that we get. The, apart from the political disruptions, climate refugees is going to be the next challenge that we're going to face. You have, as I said, 20% of the Bahamas being displaced. Where do these people go? Now, in their case, because they've got New Providence, for example, they've got bigger islands, they, they, you can obviously take in some of the people. But there was a request that was made to the United States to be able to taking some of them and it wasn't, at least in the frame, it was, the way it was framed, it wouldn't do it. But I, I'm thinking that we need to create a fund, right, that is mobilized through the IFIs in conjunction with capital, private capital in these countries to be able to build out our infrastructure in a way that we can accommodate people who are coming in. Um, that would be the only way I can see anyone participating because the first thing they're going to tell you is that Basically, it's none of their business. And I mean, and at the end of the day, it's a bank. And a lot of people don't know anything about banking. It's a bank. And if it's a bank, you want your money back. It's a bank. 
maybe a, a, a quick uh, comment here. Um, it's obvious that there are pull and push factors. I think IDB can play a role in some of the push factors to try to alleviate when they have to do with corruption, lack of opportunities. When it has to do with war or natural disaster, it's a little bit trickier for uh, an entity like the bank to play a role. But uh, the bank can play just like, for example, uh, I when I was when I work at the World Bank, I was responsible for 110 countries, basically all of Africa, the Middle East, Asia, Latin America, and the Caribbean, um, and in Iraq, in Jordan, in Syria, in a lot of countries in the Middle East, um, we, we saw. Uh, one of the largest impacts in terms of camps and refugees, which have to do with security, with logistics, and many other things. And there is, uh, uh, there are certainly some pilots, and you will be more familiar with, in terms of creating some safe zones in those countries that have difficulties. Of course, you know, uh, in Venezuela, for example, it will be very hard at this stage to try to do something like that. So you already have to deal with two, three million people uh, in Colombia. In the case of Central America, for example, in El Salvador, for economic reasons, we get people from Nicaragua, for example, that come to uh, pick coffee during October, November, December, and sometimes January as well. And that's a different uh, kind of role because they come and then they go. Uh, so I think your question related to the IDB, look at some of the uh, examples or some of the exercises that have been done uh, in the case of the World Bank, in particular in the Middle East, to try to replicate whatever is replicable in, in our region. Uh, and two, the part of creating the conditions in the countries, it's very important. If, if countries like Venezuela, uh, if that problem is not resolved, you're going to be dealing with the consequences of that in, in not only in Colombia, but uh, in, in other countries uh, neighboring Venezuela. And so it is a combination of some entities, some bodies helping to resolve the problem within Venezuela in order to minimize the migration that is taking place in that, in that particular case. And the IDB might not have a role at this moment, but it has to be ready when the time comes for action to be taking place within the country itself. Great. Listen, please join me in thanking the panelists. This was excellent. <clears throat> I'm hoping, I'm gonna ask that y'all stay seated for a second. I want my panelists to, to leave first because we gotta do a quick change of this meeting. They're all gonna be outside if you could just stay seated for a minute. So I'm gonna ask my panelists to stand up and then walk out now, if you would, please. And there's, we have a reception outside. We have drinks, we've got cheese, we've got crackers. You're all invited. I hope you'll stay. I hope you'll say hello to my, my friends, the, the panelists. Please come downstairs. So just, just stay seated just for one minute so we can get, get my friends out, because I promised the facilities folks we'd, we'd, we'd clear out the room quickly. And I know if they leave, you'll leave too, because you'll want to talk to them. So thank you very much. Thank you again, and, and please join us outside. We've got drinks outside and crackers and cheese. Please join us. Thanks again. Thanks for being with us. Thank, please join me in the panel. One last thing. Could, could, we, could we give a round of applause to our friend from the Bahamas to show our solidarity with the Bahamas, please? Okay. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you.